We're about to start, about 15 more seconds. Welcome everyone, please make yourselves comfortable. And thank you for coming to the Joiner Lecture, a very special event during our meeting. For nearly two decades, the William B. Joiner Lecture has been a don't miss event at the SSA annual meeting. A very special one where people talk a little bit less. Please, thank you, have a seat, make yourselves comfortable. A very special event that encourages collaboration and information sharing between the scientists and engineers in our global community. The connection between those groups, of course, is the key to our progress and our ability to plan for public safety. We have the seismologist extraordinaire Tom Hanks to thank for leading the charge to bring this important lecture series to our professional society. It was Tom's idea, a special way to honor his colleague and friend, Bill Joyner. For those of you who did not have the good fortune of knowing Bill, he was an outstanding, lively ground motion seismologist and also earlier in his career, he did other types of seismology too, who devoted an important part of his career to bridging the gap between our earthquake science and earthquake engineering communities. Tom Hanks worked tirelessly to create this memorial for his good friend and colleague, nurturing it since its inception in 2004. Because of you, Tom, and your really hard efforts, the work that mattered most to Bill continues this evening. Tom informed SSA last fall that he would retire as chair of the Joiner Committee. And on behalf of SSA, I'd like to give a big thanks to Tom for his outstanding stewardship of the series. Yes. Because of Tom, it has become much more than a tribute to Bill's critically important work. It has grown into a bridge connecting seismologists and engineers all over the globe. I hope that Tom's watching online and if not, he can also view the handy recording that we will have available. Please join me to give Tom a very well-deserved round of applause for his vision and his dedication and commitment to the Joiner Lectureship and Fund. Now it is a great honor to introduce Jack Baker our 2023 Joiner Lecturer. Jack is a very accomplished professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, an outstanding researcher and an insightful editor who continues to make substantial contributions to the engineering industry. Jack's innovative research is at the forefront of the interface between earthquake seismology and earthquake engineering, focusing on the use of probabilistic and statistical tools for modeling of extreme loads on structures. As head of the Stanford Urban Resilience Initiative, Jack leads projects focused on applying engineering analyses to social impact and human behavior in the context of disasters and extreme events. And most recently, I was reading a bunch of papers from his group, and wow, definitely go read his papers. His work has focused on risk to spatially distributed systems, earthquake ground motion characterization, and predictions of soil failure from earthquakes, among other topics. Jack's industry experience includes seismic hazard assessment, construction management, and modeling of catastrophic losses for insurance companies, in part as co-founder of Hazelton Baker Risk Group. His recent textbook, Seismic Hazard and Risk Analysis, was named a Prose Award finalist by the Association of American Publishers in 2022. Other honors include the Helmut Krawinkler Award in 2019 from the Structural Engineering Association of Northern California, and the 2018 Walter L. Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize from the American Society of Civil Engineering. 
Jack's colleagues praise him for his communication skills as much as his innovative research, and he's widely regarded as one of the best in both the fields of engineering seismology and earthquake engineering. In short, although he's very tall, Jack exemplifies all that the Joyner Lecture seeks to honor and advance, namely outstanding earth science contributions to the theory and practice of earthquake engineering and outstanding earthquake engineering contributions to the direction and focus of earth science research. Together with demonstrated skills of communication at the interface of earthquake science and earthquake engineering, I am delighted to welcome Jack to the stage. Please join me in a round of applause for Jack Baker, our 2023 <laughs> William B. Joyner Lecturer. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Congratulations. See another person who knows how to shake hands correctly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ruth, for the kind introduction and. Uh, Thank you to Tom Hanks for his efforts to make this uh, event possible and have happened uh, 20 times over the years. It's really um, tremendous. And thank you all for spending some time with me this evening. I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, first, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll make a, um, a warm uh, acknowledgement to the many students and colleagues who've contributed to the work that uh, I'm gonna present here tonight uh, over the years. Uh, and as many of you know, the students are the horsepower that, that makes all this happen. And, a number of collaborators have really been critical to some of the results I'll, I'll show as well. So thanks to, to all the folks named here. Uh, I wanna start before getting into some ground motion uh, plots uh, with a few extra words. Uh, I wanna go back to 2005. So uh, in 2005, I was a graduate student uh, sitting in my advisor, Alan Cornell's office. Uh, I was kind of piled high with reports and yellow legal pads full of notes everywhere. Um, and Alan was preparing for his 2005 Joiner lecture. Uh, it was clearly a special talk for Alan. He was uh, very capable of giving an impromptu talk that was extremely compelling, but he spent weeks and weeks preparing this talk um, to, to maximize the opportunity uh, and made a great, quite an impression on me. And while I was working with him to assist in the preparation of this talk, uh, he would tell me stories about Bill Joyner. Uh, so I never met Bill. I, I started graduate school six months after he passed away. Uh, and I just lived across town from where he had worked. Uh, but at the time when I was starting graduate school, I really didn't understand the impact he had had on the field that was gonna become my career. Um, so, so back to Alan's office, we were sitting in his office, uh, designing figures and, and working through the flow of, a, of this talk he was gonna present. Um, and he stopped, I remember distinctly, turned his chair and looked me in the eye. And he said, Bill always put in the time to think about the practical relevance of his research. It's easy to write papers, but it's much harder to have real impact. And it was a reminiscence about his friend that he, that he clearly uh, thought highly of. It was also very clearly career advice for me. <laughs> and he stared me in the eye for an extra beat just to make sure that I got the message. Um, and so I, I, that, that process um, you know, was um, really impactful to me as a young graduate student. Um, I learned from Alan over the years and from many other folks who are in the room, uh, many of the former joiner lecturers. Um, the bill really helped create this environment that we all now live in and, and, and Ruth spoke of um, uh, earlier. Um, you know, I, so I grew up as a researcher in this age where communication between scientists and engineers was really a rather natural thing. It, was, it wasn't anything that I thought of as a, um, requiring a lot of effort or some style unnatural. Um, and I realized you know, over my um, time as a student and a young professional how much Bill had to do with that, creating that environment. It wasn't something to be taken for granted. Uh, so being here today to give this lecture is a lot more special than just being in front of a lot of people I respect at a great event to talk about my research. Um, I'm really thrilled that the seismology engineering interface is continuing to be celebrated, uh, and I'm so happy that I can be here to help celebrate it with you. So let me turn and talk about ground motions for a little bit. What I want to talk about tonight is spatial correlations and ground motion intensity. And to help kind of get, get the sense of what we're going to talk about, I'm going to use this map. Uh, this is a map of observed ground motions from the 1999 Chi Chi earthquake in Taiwan. It's a very well recorded earthquake. Um, the, so the island is, is, is shown there. The, the gray rectangle shows an approximate surface projection of uh, the rupture. 
and the circles are all locations of recording stations, strong motion stations that recorded the ground motion. What I have plotted uh, in, in the colors is the amplitude of the one second spectral acceleration. So that's, that's a metric of ground motion intensity that I'll, I'll use for a number of the illustrations. We could substitute in other metrics of ground motion intensity and, and the story would largely hold. So, so we see, as expected, that the, the ground motions directly above and, and nearby the surface projection of the fault uh, are high in intensity, indicated by those dark colors. And as you move away um, from the fault, the ground motions tend to uh, get less intense, um, as measured by this one second spectral acceleration. But, but the variation is not uh, totally uniform, only a function of distance. So what we do in our engineering characterization or, or engineering seismology is we'll decompose this observation into a, a prediction, and we typically make this using a ground motion model, these empirical models, and that's going to account, first of all, for the effect of the magnitude of the earthquake, then the effect of attenuation with distance, um, the effect of soil conditions um, as measured by um, you know, shear wave velocities or depth to basins, um, to various parameters to reflect those conditions, and, and other geometrical and uh, uh, properties that are known to influence ground motion. So we have this, this prediction in the middle, and so that's going to predict the attenuation of ground motion with distance. Um, but we have this leftover residual, the difference between what we observed and what the ground motion model predicts in, in its mean value. And that's what's plotted over on the right, and that's what I'm going to focus on uh, for most of today. Uh, so we, we, we have the, the ground motion prediction as a baseline, but what's going on with these variations relative to the ground motion prediction? All right. And these variations are quite large. Let's also um, emphasize that first off. So it's, it's not unusual at all to see factors of two or three difference above or below the, the mean uh, or median predicted ground motion intensity. So they're very substantial variations. And um, we see in that right picture that they have patterns to them, right? They're spatial patterns. So these are not just independent realizations of, of some stations are high and some stations are low. You see to the west of the island, there's a, a big um, patch of of blue stations, indicating all of those stations had significantly lower ground motion amplitudes than the ground motion model would predict. It's a negative residual. Or up at the north of the island, there's this big patch of red uh, circles, indicating all of the ground shaking up at the north of the island was much stronger than the ground motion model would predict. All right? And so these, the, the spatial clustering of these colors is the spatial correlation that I want to dive into. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, you know, where is it coming from, how do we quantify it, what is the relevance for analyses that scientists or engineers might do, and, and what are some, some frontier areas where we can continue to advance our understanding of this phenomenon. Okay? So this, these correlations are, are clearly present in, in ground motion data like we just talked about, and they're not unexpected. Right? There, there's plenty of reasons we would expect this. Um, Right, so the, the ground motion model is predicting primarily uh, ground motions as a function of just distance from the rupture, but that rupture has um, heterogeneity within it, and things like uh, asperities are going to produce local pockets of, of strong ground shaking. Um, wave propagation is certainly an important factor here, that similar uh, stations uh, far from the rupture presumably saw um, wave propagation that followed similar paths, and so any sort of deep structure um, would cause, you know, com comparable constructive or destructive interference of waves or, or focusing or, or other effects um, that would tend to affect a whole spatial region and not just a single location one by one. And then a third um, possible mechanism here is local site effects. So there's, we understand strong effects of uh, local site conditions. There's lots of uh, interesting sessions uh, earlier today discussing these characterization of local site conditions. The ground motion models primarily use a, an average shear wave velocity value. Um, and maybe a depth to basin parameter to predict ground shaking. Uh, we know there's a lot more than that going on with local side effects. And nearby stations are presumably um, having, sharing some geologic structure uh, that's not characterized by the ground motion model, and so they would tend to see similar local side effects that's unexplained by the ground motion model and thus correlated residuals of this type. So there's lots of physical mechanisms why this would be present. Uh, next, I want to talk about why they matter. So these spatial correlations are important in a number of different applications. So one is uh, shake maps uh, and a uh, variety of uses of, of shake maps, such as earthquake reconnaissance. So um, here I've taken a, a um, map from the uh, February um, earthquake this year in Turkey. And what we see here is in, in triangles noted uh, recording stations that recorded this instrument. And then the, the contour lines are inferred uh, peak ground velocity values, uh, among other ground motion metrics. And these contours are inferred using the, um, the finite fault model, ground motion prediction, site conditions, and then a spatial correlation model to interpolate between those recording stations and infer what the ground shaking could be at other locations. Um, here, this is, this is a mean interpolated plot, 
Uh, there's also exciting developments to characterize uncertainty in these shake maps. Uh, again, I was, just came from a session uh, talking about some of these developments. Um, those, that uncertainty at a given location is going to depend on how far you are from recording stations and how correlated your location's amplitude is with those recording stations. Right? So these correlations are, are important uh, underneath this. Uh, Bruce Warden and colleagues uh, have, for instance, a, a 2018 paper and, and also some more recent papers uh, documenting how these correlations come into play in their calculations. This is a matter, this is important uh, uh, issue for um, a variety of uses of shake maps. Uh, among them would be earthquake reconnaissance. So the, the many engineers and others who are out in the field looking at uh, damage from this event um, are observing damage and they need to infer what level of ground shaking that those structures or infrastructure experienced that caused that damage. And so these shake maps are really critical for applications like that. Another way in which these ground motion correlations are important is for any sort of regional risk analysis where we're looking at impacts uh, that are dependent on ground shaking at more than one location. So to take one example of this type from uh, some earlier work from my group, uh, I'll, I'll just try to give you a primer on, on how we do some of these regional risk analyses. Uh, the left panel here is a, um, a simulation of earthquake ground motions. So we, we take a realization of a rupture. Uh, this is in uh, San Francisco, California, uh, near where I live. Uh, we've got a black line in the um, south portion of the map indicating a, a sampled rupture. We then use the ground motion model to predict median ground motion amplitudes. We simulate those residuals with spatial correlation, uh, reflecting what we saw in the Chi Chi event, among others. And so that's this colored pattern in the left map. This, this map of ground shaking intensities is then overlain on a map of exposed assets. In this case, it's uh, highway bridges. So the middle panel shows the locations of all of the state-operated highway bridges in the area. Uh, color-coded according to whether they were uh, predicted to be damaged or not, given that ground shaking intensity. Once we have damage to all these individual components, we then uh, bring in a transportation model that's in the, shown in the right panel. So this is a map of all of the roads in the region, the capacities of those roads, and the traveler demand to get from place to place within the region, uh, which is a, you know, um, information that's collected by transportation agency folks uh, frequently. And we adopt or, or we adjust the capacity of those roads to reflect um, damage to bridges. So for instance, a, a severely damaged bridge wouldn't be allowed to carry traffic over it or under it until it was repaired. And with that reduced capacity, we then re-simulate the traffic flows and the extra travel time that's um, uh, resulting from people having to take alternate routes to get where they want to get to if they still choose to make a trip. So this is one realization. We then perform this realization thousands of times over different rupture events that could occur in the region different realizations of ground shaking intensity, different realizations of bridge damage, to get a sense of the potential future impacts of earthquakes in the region to this example infrastructure system. And we can summarize results like that in a plot like this. So here the, the horizontal axis is the consequence metric that's coming out of those simulations. Uh, in this case, it's a travel time delay aggregated over all users in the network over a, a given hour during rush hour. And so each realization, like on the previous slide, gives us one number of a travel time delay. And over all those thousands of realizations, for each threshold on this plot, we count up how many of those simulations met or exceeded some threshold of travel time delay. And the frequency of simulations causing that level of disruption gives us the y-ordinate on the plot. And so we can see on the, on the left, we have low consequence, you know, frequently occurring uh, small earthquakes. And as we move over to the right, these are the extremely disruptive cases where we have very large impacts to the users of the infrastructure, but, uh, but they're rare. And then we could you know, probe the system to think about how we could improve it and improve that performance. So this is an example result of that type using you know, our, our best treatment of the ground motion spatial correlation. So we have the, the ground motion simulations uh, at, with, with spatially correlated residuals. We can repeat this whole process, but turn off that spatial correlation. Instead of having the, the correlation that we know physically exists, we could simulate independent residuals at each location within the study region for those Monte Carlo simulations. If we do that, we get the middle line uh, that's labeled without spatial correlation in red. If we repeat the whole process and just turn off the ground motion variability completely, we get the, the bottom line in the plot. And so these, these uncertainties in the ground motions have a, have a real impact, particularly for the high consequence, uh, high disruption cases here in the network. This is a, typically observed in situations like this. And what's going on is that you know, station by, or location by location, the correlation doesn't have any impact. So any given bridge has an equal you know, likelihood of being damaged with or without the spatial correlation. But when we have spatial correlation, we tend to see regions of strong shaking uh, or regions of weak shaking, which is a little less important from the engineering perspective. And when we see a whole region with strong shaking, we're likely to damage a bridge as well as damage a bridge associated with an alternate path. And so we have these kind of you know, cascading uh, snowballing impacts 
uh, that we don't see when we, when we don't consider that spatial correlation. So, so this is understood to impact tail risk. This is also a phenomenon that's really well understood in the catastrophe risk modeling world for insurance companies that are insuring portfolios of, of buildings or, or houses and things like that. The correlations in, in uh, loading on those different properties is influencing their tail risk of what's the possibility that they're gonna have you know, high claims on all of these properties at once or, or on many properties at once. And so these correlations are well understood in that area as well. Okay, so that's a quick few minute primer on, on how engineers think about some of these issues and, and why we would care about these spatial correlations. Next, I want to talk about estimating these spatial correlations. We've just talked qualitatively about how they exist, and I alluded that I was simulating ground motions with these correlations, but, but how do we calibrate a model like that? So let's, let's talk that over. Ideally, if we were thinking about spatial correlations in Taiwan, what we would like is, um, well, first we would like stations all over the island. We've got quite a few here, but you know, we, we could always uh, wish for more. Uh, we would also like to have repeat observations of ground motions at all of those stations, so that we could pick a pair of ground motion st stations and we could have repeat observations of the ground motion amplitude at each of those stations over and over again, and we could look at how correlated those residuals were from event to event to event. That's usually not possible um, because we're, you know, fortunately, we see these very large events rarely, um, and so we don't get the repeat observations. We just don't have very many places where instruments have been out long enough to, to collect robust kind of pairwise data like that. So short of the, that kind of wish list for data, what we do is we assume stationarity. And so we say, rather than each pair of stations being unique and having its own correlation, we're gonna assume that that correlation depends only on the separation distance between the stations, and any pair of stations with the same separation distance has the same correlation. Right? So that's an assumption. We'll revisit it in a minute. Um, but what it does is it allows us to pool data. So we could take a single event like this and find all of the station pairs with a given separation distance and use that as our pooled data set to estimate correlations. So just to illustrate, the, the left scatter plot there shows all of the station pairs with a separation distance between zero and three kilometers. And the, the residual from one station is plotted versus the residual from the other station. And so you see a relatively high correlated um, scatter plot there, where if, if one station is higher than, than the ground motion model predicted, a positive residual, the other station nearby is extremely likely to also be positive. If we move to larger separation distances, like in that, uh, the right scatter plot from 30 to 30, 33 kilometer separation, the correlation is decreasing, right? So the, the further apart the stations get, the less correlated those ground motions are, consistent with intuition and, and some of the physical mechanisms I posited earlier. Okay, so that gives us these, these um, sets of, of data like this. So here at, at two separation distances, I've got these scatter plots and we've got an estimated correlation coefficient. We can repeat this process over and over again, just stepping through all the separation distances and we'll get results like this. So this is a plot, uh, horizontal axis is separation distance. I'll denote that H. Uh, here, so how many kilometers apart are the two stations? And vertical axis is the estimated correlation coefficient. And each blue circle is one of those data points like on the previous slide. Okay? And so we see this typical pattern that at very small separation distances, the correlations are very high. And as you get out to uh, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 kilometers, the correlation decays pretty substantially that it's not, uh, um, there's not much there anymore. Okay, and, and that's a nice uh, spatial scale to think about, that this is not a, a phenomenon at the scale of like in meters, it's really at like the one to 10 kilometer scale where this is important. But that's a scale where a lot of engineering applications worry about uh, ground motion impacts. Okay, so we get all this data, and then for the purposes of forward prediction, we're gonna fit a model, right? So we'll, we'll fit this black line um, through that data, and, and under the assumption that the, the scatter in the blue circles is, is small sample variability, and that the black line is, is an estimate of the underlying correlation as a function of distance. And so in this case, this is a exponentially decaying model as a function of separation distance, and I'm gonna refer to this as a traditional model for the purposes of uh, reference later, okay? So, so that's the process we go through to do this estimation. Um, and so for a given earthquake, go through, pull up all the data, get these blue circles, Fit this, fit this correlation model, and then you can do forward prediction or, or do interpolation or anything like that. So these types of models have been fit for on the order of 20 years now. Um, Dave Bohr uh, uh, was one of the first people to, to study these types of things. Um, Bill Joyner was actually a co-author on that paper. Um, Tsuyoshi Takata in, in Japan was another, um, but, but anyways, uh, many folks have been looking at models like this for 20 years or so now, and I wanna talk a little more about that. Okay. So that's, we got the basic story now, that there's these spatial correlations present in strong ground motion, 
We can estimate them from data, and they're important for a few of these application areas that, that we introduced, all right? So if you've got that as a, as a primer, I hope that's, that's a useful um, outcome from your time here this evening. Uh, now what I wanna do is, is talk about some complexities that are maybe uh, simplified away in that story, and, and what else can we learn? Where, where might we go to, to deepen our understanding of this phenomenon? Okay, so to, to motivate these kind of complexities that I've, I glossed over in that first version, um, Let's take a look at two events. So in the, in the upper right map, I've got that, that Chi Chi Taiwan event uh, once again. And in the uh, uh, map to the left, this is uh, ground, similar ground motion residuals from the Whittier Narrows uh, earthquake in Southern California. And so both of these, we've got you know, an earthquake, well recorded. We take the ground motion prediction, get the residuals, do that spatial correlation estimation. And that's what's shown in the bottom figure. So we have separation distance on the horizontal axis versus correlation coefficient and, and that traditional model fitting um, to give those curves and I hid the underlying data just for clarity. And so what we see is that those two curves for the two different events don't sit exactly on top of each other. Right, so for separation distances of 10 or 20 or 30 kilometers, the Taiwan event has got noticeably larger correlations than uh, were estimated from the Whittier Narrows event. And so this has been reported almost as long as these spatial correlation studies have been going on since 2010 uh, or 20, 2008 or so at least. Um, a number of different groups have, have done this. And a number of folks have hypothesized different explanations for what's going on for these discrepancies. So um, one early explanation was regional variations. Uh, Katsugoda and Gail Atkinson, amongst others, um, did studies of Japanese data and California data and, and seemed to see systematic differences. And they said, well, maybe Japan and California are just distinct um, and causing difference in co correlations. Um, so magnitude dependence is a, is a reasonably intuitive one that as a, as a finite rupture gets bigger, that might change the spatial scale at which correlations are present. It's been shockingly hard to find any sort of evidence for that empirically, um, but it's, it's certainly been an idea that's been thrown around a lot. Uh, site conditions I mentioned earlier as, as one of the causes of these correlations. And so the thought here being that um, areas with kind of di different nature of, of their heterogeneity and site conditions might have you know, then resulting um, differences in spatial correlations as a result of those site condition heterogeneities. Um, and then another thought is just that these are is event specific variability. Um, that each event is its own unique thing and it's gonna have for variations in the, in the characteristics of that event, that just manifests in um, variations in the spatial correlations that are not explainable ahead of time. So those are all hypothesized, various levels of data for those, um, but we've been scratching our head uh, recently to seeing if we could make some further progress on those, those questions. So first I wanna give you a, a couple um, ways that we try to think about um, evidence for this. Uh, the first path forward we were thinking about is just let's use physics-based simulations rather than just empirical data. Um, so here we were taking advantage of the CyberShake simulations. Uh, this is a, a very large effort um, by the Southern California Earthquake Center that I'm, I know many in the room are familiar with um, to produce uh, very large numbers of ground motion uh, simulations based on like a physical, physically motivated wave propagation through a 3D velocity model, uh, trying to bring in a lot of the processes that would, would cause variations in strong ground motion. Um, fortunately for us, the, the, the thing that's appealing is that there are 400,000 rupture simulations in the, this is the version 15 that we were using. Um, and so we've got this massive amount of ground motion compared to what we would be able to uh, you know, record. And there's 336 stations in this study area that, that are used. And so each of those 336 stations has, you know, essentially infinite amount of, uh, of data that we can use to actually look at pairwise correlations between pairs of stations. I told you earlier, we can't do that in the real world, but, but with CyberShake data, we can. And if the physics driving some of these correlations are present in these simulations, this is a great opportunity to look at causality. And so what we did is we didn't, we didn't take all 400,000 in a shot. We would look at a, at a given rupture um, geometry. So this, there's some plots of um, Puente Hill's uh, rupture geometry. Uh, and then and kind of ground motion residuals at all of those stations uh, shown for multiple realizations. So we'll take a fixed rupture geometry, take all those residuals, and then pair of stations by pair of stations, look at those correlations and see what we see um, relative to the kind of empirically motivated traditional models. So let me show you some results here. Um, first, I'll back up to the traditional empirical model in the upper left-hand corner. This is um, correlations from the, the empirical data. And, and let me talk you through what's being shown here. So this is that same study region in Southern California where the cybershake motions are present. The, um, the lines passing to the kind of northeast of the uh, mapped area is a surface projection of a San Andreas, southern San Andreas rupture. Um, that's the rupture considered here in these uh, cases. The triangle down to the southwest of the map uh, is a reference station. And then what we're doing is we're plotting the correlation coefficient between 
ground motions at that reference station with all of the other locations in the study area. And so with this empirical model, it's simply a function of separation distance. So we have this kind of bullseye decay in correlation. As you move away from the reference station, your correlation goes down, and that's all there is to it. Okay. And that's in contrast to, in the lower left corner, this is the correlations we get from CyberShake. So here, rather than assume this distance decay, we hold that reference station constant, and with all 300 and some other stations, we compute a pairwise correlation coefficient from all these southern San Andreas ruptures. And so we see a little bit more spatial pattern here. Um, and uh, this, so this is a station that, that is sitting kind of um, just at the edge of the LA basin. Uh, the lower right figure is another map like this where we've moved the reference station outside of the LA basin. And you can see kind of, um, you know, interesting patterns in the, in the patches of high correlation with those reference stations. In the upper right is a figure of the kind of a basin depth metric um, indicating this LA basin that's in the area. And so we think we see indications that the um, kind of correlation, if you're in, if the reference station is within the basin, you see kind of higher correlations with other basin sites. If you're at the edge of the basin, you might see correlations with uh, other basin edge sites, um, as might be expected given the, um, the you know, wave focusing that, that that sedimentary basin can cause. Uh, there's also evidence in these uh, data of kind of um, wave propagation effects. So in the uh, left map here, this is now the, the rupture considered as this Puente Hills rupture, kind of shown in the rectangle in the middle of the map. The reference site is at the south end of the rupture, and you see this very high correlation with all of the other locations at the south end of the rupture, and actually negative correlations off to the north of the rupture. And so here we think this is just a rupture uh, effect, that if, if the rupture is, is propagating uh, north to south, that kind of all the stations to the south are going to see stronger ground motion amplitudes, and, the, and the, the stations on the opposite side of the rupture might see, uh, you know, weaker amplitudes. And so you could see this kind of negative correlation or, or high correlation with the neighboring uh, sites. Uh, similarly, over on the right is another kind of geometry. The rupture is kind of off the edge of the map. But we see this kind of high correlation for sites that share, like, similar wave propagation paths from the rupture. And so we see, again, some evidence of, of these physical phenomena that we think might be driving these correlations. So that, that's helpful to just get an understanding of what, um, what might be causing more correlations beyond just separation distance. The second way we were probing this problem is to try to look for places where we actually could get over this, this data um, availability problem. And so here, uh, working with Brendan Bradley, uh, we looked at data in New Zealand, um, both in Christchurch and Wellington area. I'll just show you Christchurch today. Um, but this uh, area is notable in that there were, um, there's 25 earthquakes of kind of engineering interest within the range of the, the ground motion models uh, in that area. And there are 26 uh, strong ground motion instruments in the area. You know, not all of the instruments recorded all of the events, but, but we have very good coverage and, and a lot of repeat observations for many of those instruments. This is primarily through the 2010-2011 the sequence of earthquakes that occurred in this area. And so what we did, again, like with CyberShake, is we took um, computed ground motion residuals for each of these stations and, and earthquakes, and then we took pairwise correlation coefficients between each uh, station pair that was in the study area. And so here's what we um, see out of that. See how it looks for you. Um, so what we did is we, uh, we took the study region and, and, and um, split it up a bit. So um, let's talk, I guess, first the, the northwest portion of the, the map on the left. Um, this is all kind of dense gravels. And we've got a number of stations there. So we took all of the pairs of stations that were both in that northwest region and computed their correlation coefficients, computed the distance apart, and plotted those on that top scatter plot. So the circles uh, plotted on that uh, figure are pairwise station correlation coefficients. The black line is one of these traditional models assuming stationarity that kind of blends together all the available data. And so we see that for pairs of stations within that northwest region, most of them have higher correlations than would be predicted by that traditional distance-only model. And, and they have, uh, you know, relatively similar site conditions. Um, they're also, you know, there's some shared path effects, but we didn't try to control for that too much. You, you've maybe looked ahead of me here, but we did the same thing for uh, pairs of stations that were in that south region. So this is all kind of rock outcrop on the Banks Peninsula. It's very hard on um, uh, site conditions generally, much harder than in the northwest. And it, again, we took all the pairs of stations uh, in that south region, plotted them in that bottom scatter plot, and again, most of those pairs of stations have higher correlation than you would predict using one of these stationary distance-only models. Then, if you take pairs of stations where one station is in that south region, and one station is somewhere else, repeat that whole exercise, those are all plotted in this bottom right plot, and we see that most of those station pairs have much lower correlation than a stationary model would predict. So um, here, I think this is, seems to be relatively clear evidence that the site conditions are playing an important role, right? That 
that the, when both stations are on a rock site condition, they're going to have similar kind of uh, uh, side effects. When one station's on a rock condition and one's on a, uh, you know, a, a much softer condition, that the side effects are going to be somewhat independent and you lose this correlation that you see when you have a shared um, subsurface conditions. Okay, so with that as kind of background over the last few years, um, then this is a very recent work, uh, mostly led by Lucas Bodenman, who's a um, student of Bojidar uh, Stoyadinovich at ETH Zurich, who was over uh, visiting last year. And what we did is, is so that traditional model is there as reference, that's our distance only model up top. We, we looked at a, at a more complex parameterization of this situation. And so we've got um, this new model down below that's got a couple extra predictor variables and some extra coefficients to fit to it. And I want to talk you through kind of the, the motivation for this functional form. Um, so let's look at that functional form kind of term by term. So in this figure on the left, what I've got is just a map to kind of think through the situation where we would want to predict uh, correlations. So there's, a, there's an earthquake epicenter in the upper left. Uh, there's two sites, site I and site J. They're separated by distance H, right? That's, and that was what the traditional models look at only. It's just that separation distance. Okay. So then the, the colored panel here, we've got this earthquake epicenter. We've got a reference location indicated um, uh, in the middle of that bullseye. And then what the color is plotting, the correlation, uh, predicted correlation with every other location in the study region uh, re relative to that uh, reference site. And so we see this, this bullseye again of just simple decay with separation distance. So that's the first term in this new model. It's the same thing as the traditional model. We've got an exponential decay in correlation with separation distance. But there's a couple extra terms left. So then we add um, a term where we make an additional modification as a function of the, the angle in azimuths from the earthquake epicenter to the two sites. So over on that left panel, we've added in this, this DA term, which is just the angle between the, um, those kind of um, paths from the epicenter to the sites. So when that angle is small, we'll expect to see more shared wave propagation and, and higher correlation. And when that angle gets larger, then we, we would expect to see less correlation. And so that, when we add that into the correlation model, that's shown with the, uh, the contours in the right uh, panel here, where now separation distance is not the same in all directions. Separation distance is kind of along the direction from the uh, epicenter to the reference site, though we see kind of higher correlations in that direction. If we move orthogonal to that direction, we're going to have a faster decay in correlations. Then the third predictor variable, we're going to use a, a site condition metric. And so what we did here, um, so the, the left map now is filled in with some hypothetical uh, VS30 values, so average shear wave velocity over the top 30 meters of the site. And we're going to take the difference in VS30 values between the two stations as some metric of dissimilarity. Um, right, these are all kind of simplified metrics, but, but relatively easy to estimate and, and use in a predictive model. So now the spatial correlations are going to decay faster when the, the VS30 values for the two sites are more different. If the VS30 values are the same or similar, we'll have higher correlations with this parameterization. So you can see moving from the kind of the middle um, blue map to the right blue map, we've now kind of chopped up those uh, ellipses of correlation so that um, the, you know, the locations that have similar soil conditions have higher correlations, but uh, locations with dissimilar soil conditions have lower correlations, right? So we're not trying to make a prediction. We're not trying to predict the site conditions. We're just saying that if two sites have similar VS30 values, they are going to tend to have similar, you know, uh, other site characteristics and, and similar site effects to some degree that it would influence the correlations. That's the idea. Okay, so then, you know, th that's a new parameterization, trying to build on the inferences from those earlier studies I showed you. Um, but we've got a, a trade-off here, right? We've moved to a more complex model. It's got more parameters that have to be fit. Those will be uncertain parameters, of course. Um, and, and we also want to evaluate, are we getting like extra predictive power out of this parameterization? So we, we scratched our head on that for a little while. Um, take the chance, given, given the audience, just to try to draw an analogy to ground motion models. So the, the direct prediction of ground motion intensity means and standard deviations. Um, and I, th I see some parallel of kind of what we've been doing for a couple decades to the very early ground motion models, thinking about like a Steva and Rosenbluth. They were just simply, ground motion was a function of magnitude and distance or, or log distance. And that was the, the whole model. Um, as we moved along, you know, a few more decades, uh, uh, again, Bill Joyner with colleagues um, produced one of the popular models of the, of the 1990s where they added in an extra predictor variable for VS30, uh, and there was also an, a modification for rupture mechanism. So bringing in more predictor variables to reflect our growing understanding of the physics of, of ground motion amplitudes. And then as we, as we move to kind of a more modern era, the models, you know, increasingly bring in more predictor variables, more coefficients, more complex functional forms. Um, and, you know, as we reflect, uh, you know, understand a deeper understanding of, of what's going on with ground motions, the, the models naturally evolve to 
bring that into the predictions. And so I, th I think we're somehow on this continuum with these correlation models, although uh, they're, they're quite uh, simple relative to the, the ground motion models of the modern era. Okay, so, so how we went about trying to think about this of, of is the extra um, predictive power um, you know, justified in this case, and, and because these are correlations, we need kind of pooled values of pairs of stations. It's not so simple to do like a direct statistical test on predictive power. Um, so here's what we were thinking about. Um, so we would take a, a given event, um, so back to that Chi Chi Taiwan uh, earthquake and the ground motion residuals, we will um, go fit, the, get all those binned correlations, fit a correlation model, that traditional model. This time we're going to do Bayesian parameter estimation, so that's going to give us explicit uncertainty on the parameters. Uh, so we're not going to pretend that we know those parameters of the model um, perfectly. And that's indicated by the, the confidence interval in that top correlation plot, reflecting, you know, the correlation's got some sort of uh, interval on it now due to the parameter uncertainty. Then we take that correlation model, we return to the original data, so we're doing kind of a within sample test, but we check the predictive power on the observed ground motions. How, how compatible are those observed ground motions with the hypothesized correlation model? We'll take these, we'll take Monte Carlo samples of those parameter estimates. So each, each sample has got a new parameter estimate and, and a, may do a little better or worse against that data. And we'll compute some sort of metric of predictability. So this, this bottom plot is showing a histogram over the realizations of the, um, of the model coefficients of log posterior predictive density. There's a definition there, but all you need to know is that values to the right indicate kind of more agreement between the model and the data. And, and this, this metric is penalized by um, parameter uncertainty. So for overfitting a model, we'd have poor constraints on these parameters. We're going to pay a price in this metric because some of those parameter samples are going to be inconsistent with the data. Okay, so here's one fit to a traditional model, distance-only model, to one earthquake. Now we're going to turn these, this process uh, across some different data sets and see how these models are doing. So here I'll do a, a comparison. So on the left is what we just talked about. We've got one, we'll look at one earthquake event. We'll do a fit to just that event, uh, and we'll use this traditional model that's just a function of separation distance. On the right, we took a much bigger pool of data. Uh, so we've got 128 events that had um, at least 40 recordings within some separation distance threshold and, and so on. So good enough, uh, well enough recorded that we thought we could get a correlation estimate out of it. We're going to pool all 128 events together. So that gives us a lot more data, but we lose that event-specific variation. We're going to fit the new model with three predictive parameters and five or so coefficients. And, and so we'll, we'll pay the price with those, those coefficients, but, but hopefully get some predictive power from the new parameters. And then we'll, we'll run these both against that Chi Chi Taiwan event uh, in this case. So, so here we'll run through that, that middle act, that middle plot is now the, the performance. And so what we see is that the, this new model, even though it's fit to a global data set, when it's applied back to the Chi Chi data, those um, log posterior predictive densities are all to the right, indicating a better agreement or, or kind of more predictive power of this new model relative to the traditional model, even though the new model was fit to a global data set. Okay? So this is kind of a comparison of an event-specific simpler model versus a, a more complex but a, a global model that's not event-specific. All right, so then we repeated that exercise for all 128 earthquakes. And so the, this big plot is showing um, the results from all those 128 tests. So each circle is one earthquake where we did an event-specific fit to that earthquake and we compared it to this global model fit to all the earthquakes. So the x-axis shows the number of records in each one of those earthquakes. The, the Chi Chi event we were looking at had almost 400 uh, uh, recordings, so that's plotted at an x-ordinate of about 400. And then the vertical axis is showing the, the relative performance of these two approaches. And so values above zero on the top half of the plot, this is where this new global model is more predictive of the data, and values below zero, the, the event-specific fit was more predictive of the data. Okay. So it's a little messy. Uh, there's not like a dominant, uh, you know, a clear dominance uh, one way or the other. Especially the left half of the plot, it, it kind of looks like a toss-up. But as you move to the right half of the plot, these well-recorded events, the, this global model is clearly kind of coming out uh, as the winner in almost every case. And it, it's, it's perhaps a little counterintuitive that these events with a lot of data, you would think you could get a good event-specific fit to the data. Um, but it turns out that actually we're just getting clearer evidence from those well-recorded events. We, it's, it's a little easier to tell the difference between the two models, and we can tell the difference that this model with the extra predictive parameters is, is winning. The other thing is this is just kind of retrospective testing on the data we have. If we want to do a forward prediction to a, you know, consider hypothetical future earthquakes, these event-specific, you know, approaches is a little bit problematic because it's, it's hard to say what the next event-specific correlation model is going to be. You have to kind of randomize and, and throw some extra uncertainty into the process. Um, so there's a, there's a big advantage of being able to use a single global model for forward prediction if, in fact, it, if, if it bears out as being more predictive, which we think we're seeing in, in these types of tests.
So, so returning back to my, my kind of opening um, uh, slide from the, the second half of the presentation, if we come back to Whittier and Arrows and, and Chi Chi, you know, I said, you know, lots of people were recording these event specific variations and had different ideas through this kind of last few minutes of the talk. I hope I've set the stage a little bit to say, you know, maybe there's an explanation for what's going on here. And specifically in this case, if, if we look at those top maps, um, you know, Chi Chi, the, and, and there's a small distance scale at the bottom of the, the Chi Chi map that 40 kilometers is actually not very far on this map. And so, you know, the, the patches of blue and red residuals are all these kind of 20 to 40 kilometer uh, uh, separation distances. When we take stations that are, you know, only 40 kilometers apart or less, in Chi Chi, they tend to have a pretty narrow azimuthal angle. You've got a pretty, pretty significant shared propagation path from the rupture to these sites. Whereas Whittier and Arrows, because the stations are a little closer together and they're kind of all around this rupture, you've got a lot of bigger angles. And so this bottom plot here is showing a histogram of these azimuthal angles for all the station pairs that are less than 40 kilometers apart. And so the, the Chi Chi data has, has pretty small angles in general. The Whittier and Arrows data has a lot more pairs of stations with big angles. And this new correlation model says big azimuthal angles means lower correlation. And so rather than this, this uh, lower left uh, plot of correlations indicating some sort of event specific characteristic, I think it's just extra you know, features of the, the correlation structure that weren't predicted by the simple distance model. In this case, the azimuthal angles being different between the two earthquakes uh, and just where the stations happen to be gave this apparent difference in the correlations if we didn't account for those azimuthal angles. So, so with, these, with these kind of new tests we've done and, and kind of the functional form we got to, I think it's becoming more, more clear to me at least, and I hope I'm persuading you, that really these source to site geometries and the, the site conditions, which I'm not showing as much here, those are really um, some of the causes of these apparent differences from event to event, is that each event you know, takes place at a different, different place in the world and the stations are in different locations and the geology is different, and so we would expect those things to cause apparent differences in correlations. Okay. Um, so then with this new model that I hope I gave you some, some thought provoking evidence at least that, that, that it's worth taking into account these extra predictor variables. The other piece of this puzzle is like, does any of this matter, right? Is, so what from a um, practical perspective? So we didn't go all the way through the, this, um, the risk analysis, but we were trying to get a sense of like what impact this would have on regional risk. So here, um, this is coming back to uh, uh, the, the left map is the San Francisco Bay Area. San Francisco is the peninsula in the lower left of the um, map. And we hypothesized a rupture on the Hayward Fault over in the um, kind of center to the north of the map. And we pulled off these kind of four study areas to, to look at in the area. And those were chosen based on their different um, orientations relative to the fault, as well as their differences in um, heterogeneity of site conditions. So um, say like study area one is, is on a relatively uniform uh, site conditions. That's, that's indicated by the coloring in the map uh, as measured by VS30. Uh, study area two has got a mix of kind of softer sediment to the southwest and some harder rock conditions up to the northeast. And so um, what we have and, and what's plotted over on the right is a set of Monte Carlo simulations of, of ground motions through, um, through just considering this one rupture. And we made multiple realizations of the ground motion residuals using the two different correlation models. One just being the traditional distance only model, the other being this new model with the site conditions and, and azimuthal um, variations in there. And then for, this is a study area one and two, we counted what fraction of the locations in the study area um, exceeded some threshold of ground motion amplitude. And that could be a proxy for damage in the area. And so we see in that plot, the, uh, the dashed black line is, is a lot higher than the uh, solid line, uh, at least for the kind of right half of the plot. So we're, with that traditional distance only model, we're predicting higher um, likelihood of exceeding uh, or, or of, of seeing ground motions where a large fraction of the study area has high amplitudes. And that's because the, the study area one and two have kind of different azimuthal difference, distances, different site conditions, and so the, the refined correlation model would d d uh, dampen some of the correlations because of those effects in a way that the traditional model wouldn't. Okay? And so that we think would have potentially some impact on risk metrics um, if we were looking in that study area. But that's not kind of uniform. So just to um, you know, be, a, be my own devil's advocate, looking at study areas three and four, a little more distant from the uh, rupture, uh, kind of shared azimuthal angles, and relatively uniform site conditions, there's really no practical impact of using this new model. So it's, I think it's not guaranteed that we would see big differences uh, in every case, um, but we're just trying to get a, some kind of preliminary results to get a sense of this. What I'd love to do is get back to that transportation network and try to run these through all the way with the new correlation models, but we just haven't gotten to that yet. Um, but stay tuned, hopefully. Okay, so... Um, I, we kind of hopefully, you know, first part of the uh, talk, I got you some basics of spatial correlations. Talked through here for a little bit about kind of where we've been pushing lately in, in my own group. 
um, and, and kind of where it fits within the broader dialogue on this topic within the scientific community. There's lots of open questions still, I think. Um, from my perspective, and, and if, it, if it inspires any of you, uh, I, I'd love to think about more about um, you know, low amplitude ground motions and how they might inform spatial correlation. So we've, we've been working exclusively with strong ground motion from, from large earthquakes. Uh, you know, if some of these effects of site conditions or, or wave propagation can be seen in, in low amplitude motions, that would obviously open up a whole world of data to us that could be really powerful. Um, you know, I, I know many of you are working on lots of exciting technologies with nodal arrays or distributed acoustic sensing where we get extremely high spatial resolutions. You know, I, I mentioned we're, we're really interested in the kind of kilometer scale or, or up, um, but, but nonetheless, the, I know many of the data sets that some of you are working with are really um, offer much more insight uh, uh, spatially than, than we're getting from these strong motion instruments. I, I'm not sure exactly how that's all going to fit together yet, but, uh, but it's certainly compelling to think about. And then also uh, returning to the numerical simulation. So we, we, I showed you briefly some results that we were using from the CyberShake simulations. Um, and I, I, so, so my take simply as a consumer of those simulations, not a producer of them, is that on, on the whole, the, the spatial correlations present in those simulations seem quite consistent with what we see in uh, recorded ground motions. But we have this chance to explore causality. So, so what, what effect does the heterogeneity and the rupture parameters uh, have on spatial correlations? How does the velocity model uh, used for the wave propagation influence spatial correlations? There, there's obviously some, some um, opportunities to think about causality there that I think would inform the, the types of empirical fitting that we're doing here. Um, so that, I think, would be quite interesting as well. Uh, from the engineering side, there, there's, there's quite a bit as well. Um, you know, I, I didn't offer you, you a definitive answer of when these refined models are needed. We, we kind of finished with, a, you know, sometimes it seems like they make a difference, sometimes not. Um, it would be great to have a sense ahead of time, um, you know, how important is this and how critical is it to, to upgrade predictive models to account for these other effects. Uh, you know, also there's, there's not much of a, a software code base available to do this within these regional risk analyses, and so um, we'll need to kind of upgrade some of our calculation software. Uh, you know, there's some data availability issues. You know, we're, if we're if we're at, you know, using inferred BS30 values versus measured BS30 values, does that does that kind of work in this? And do some of our hazard uh, and event sense generator tools give us enough geometry to, to finish these predictor variables? I think those are very addressable issues. Another um, uh, topic that I really kind of glossed over here today is um, multi-intensity measure correlation. So I, I showed you primarily one-second spectral acceleration values in all my plots. But there's lots of metrics of, of ground motion, uh, spectral accelerations at other periods, um, peak ground velocities, other metrics that are important. And those metrics are all correlated with each other at a given site, as well as correlated in space, as we talked about today. And then they're cross-correlated. So one metric at one location versus another metric at another location has cross-correlations. And we've thought um, and, and developed models about for these cross-correlations in the traditional sense, distance only. But we haven't yet kind of worked through the, the new predictor variables in a spatial cross-correlation way. So there's still some kind of gaps to, to be filled in there. I'll give you one more bonus, uh, 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 what's next, just listening to some of the uh, non-ergodic uh, ground motion talks today. I think there's going to be some very interesting interactions between these non-ergodic ground motion models that, that a number of you are working on and spatial correlations. But if I'm hypothesizing that these correlations are due to side effects or path effects that are unexplained by the ground motion model, a non-ergodic ground motion model is treating those things differently, and so there's going to be a coupling that if we go to a non-ergodic ground motion prediction, that should take out some of these correlations, and it would be interesting to kind of look at those interactions, both to, you know, again, understand what's really going on causally here, as well as to make sure that our, our ground motion models are consistent with the correlation models we're, we're applying on top of them. So I continue to be excited about the topic, and, and I hope I've gotten a few of you excited about it as well. Um, so to start uh, wrapping up here, uh, if I conclude with kind of one message, uh, I would like to leave you all thinking that um, there are clearly uh, spatially correlated uh, amplitudes in ground motions that we observe from past earthquakes, and those correlations have important imp implications for a number of application areas. So, so this is a, a you know not not every problem that we all study is, is needs this front and center, but there are a number of places where this is really an important issue. And so, if you if you got that, if nothing else, that's that's great. Um, you know, as we've continued to, to build out our catalogs of ground motions, build out the uh, ability to simulate ground motions, um, we've got, a, you know, more and more ability to, like, understand these correlations and build predictive models. Um, I've, I've talked to you about this new predictive model that we've been uh, thinking about lately. I, it's not certainly not the last one uh, that'll come along, and there, there's certainly improvements we can already think of uh, to it. I think, clearly, as we move forward, um, these correlation models are going to use both uh, observational data as well as numerical simulations, again, following the path, uh, the well-worn path of the ground motion modelers uh, decades earlier to lean on simulations as well as kind of theory and as well as empirical data. 
the correlation models have really been primarily empirical until now, um, but I think that you know the time has come to move forward in that regard. I think also we can we can clearly, and I hope I've made the case today, we can account for path effects and side effects in these correlations uh, to some extent, and we can build those into our predictive models. And now we need to understand kind of what the implications are for some of those application areas I discussed earlier. Um, a couple final notes. So one, I've got this URL at the bottom. So I've kind of flashed some references at the bottom of the screen. The, those references are all posted at this uh, website. Um, if you're interested in digging in a little more to some details I glossed over, we also have a number of software packages to do some of the estimation. Uh, and so we'd be very pleased if anybody's interested and in, in wants to grab some of that software and, and play around with their own data sets or, or improve upon what we've been thinking about. Um, and then finally, I, I want to close with one last thought. Um, so, so I had this slide up and I, I was very happy because of my work in 2005 with, with Alan. I have the, the whole slide deck from his 2005 joiner lecture. Um, I was really pleased to assist him with that and back in 2005 it was really formative for me um, and, and left a big impression. Through all those months that I was helping him with that, it, it never once crossed my mind that I would be the joiner lecturer someday. Um, and so it was really uh, you know, humbling and thought provoking when the, when the word came that I was invited this year to do this. Um, and so, um, you know, just to, to share with some of you that have, you know, on your past, like, this isn't something that, I, that ever occurred to me was going to happen uh, early on in my days. And I know there are students out in the room um, here that are just listening to some of the older folks uh, talk about their work, um, but I, I know enough statistics that know that somebody young in the room is going to give this joiner lecture someday, so, so just keep that in mind, um, that it's not some sort of uh, abstract thing. Um, uh, also, just for all of you, uh, I, I hope that you all, um, can you know, take a moment and just reflect on the fact that we're all beneficiaries of this hard work that Bill Joyner put in over the decades to, to bring our communities together. Uh, and um, I hope we can celebrate Bill uh, as we have for so many years with these Joyner lectures. So with that, I'll close. Thanks very much for your attention. I think I was told to hang out and take some questions if anybody wants to ask them. <laughs> um, I, th I guess there's microphones here. Um. Uh, thank you, Jack. It's a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, maybe you, you mentioned, uh, but my question is related to the frequency content of the ground motion. The correlation exists at all frequency, or, or, or where is more and where is less, which sure. frequencies? Great. Yeah, thank you, Luis, for, uh, for pointing that out. I, that's one of the things I glossed over, um, is that um, so these, these correlations, the, the, I was showing you empirical results for these one second spectral accelerations. These results, the, the correlations are dependent on the metric we use. Uh, I think this is where you were getting at is that if we go to lower frequency metrics, like a, a, a high frequency, if we go to higher frequency, lower period metrics, like a high frequency spectral acceleration, the, the correlation lengths tend to get smaller. So we, the correlation decays more quickly, and, and that's consistent with just the spatial scale of the wavelengths of the ground motions driving those. Um, so we do see a, a, um, a scale dependence of the, um, the spatial decay of the ground motions with frequency that we're looking at. Um, we also see, and I, I didn't show results today, that these um, the side effects in particular, that we see a frequency dependence that the kind of lower frequencies in particular seem to be a little more sensitive to differences in site conditions whereas the, the higher frequencies are not. And I, again, I think that's consistent with our intuition about wave propagation and, and site response. Thanks. Yeah, great talk, Jack. Um, so I was thinking about your measure, and I, a, there was a lot there, and I, I, I may have missed this, but it, it seems to me there ought to be some kind of magnitude dependence, because for the larger earthquakes, the, the epicenter, hypocenter, is not representative of all the subtitled angles, yep. and effectively you're averaging over paths. and, and so. You're not in your head, so you must have thought about this. And yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm completely off base. So, how would that enter into this sort of uh, analysis? Yeah, that, thank you, Greg. That's a good observation. That's that's one of the um, the deficiencies that I've, I've already had in mind. Is, um, so, I've, we've got a relatively simple um, geometry for these like azimuthal angles, and yeah, for finite faults, it's, we've clearly you know missed out on some of this. Uh, what we know controls wave propagation. You know, I, I think to some degree, you know, the ground motion amplitudes are using more, more realistic metrics of, of distance, and so that's explained away a little bit. We did try fitting with some alternate metrics of like angles from like closest point on a rupture to the site. We didn't see big differences in predictive power, um, so the, the student kind of moved on. I, I think it's because the database is largely populated by 
relatively distant locations and relatively small events, and so we're just, you know, the statistics aren't bearing out the, the really important close-in uh, large magnitude events. I think I have, um, you know, I think we could, we could refine that metric, um, and it wouldn't be hard to repeat the process. We just need to tune up the predictor variables a little bit more. So thanks for the observation. Um, I, I thought of this question before Greg asked his, but his is actually a better application of this. I was wondering if you could, uh, if there's a possibility of uh, using like a uh, machine learning methods to estimate, for example, you have the functional form where you have some linearities, whether that should be to the power of, you know, 1.1, 1.2 instead of 1, but also looking at the, de um, the dependence on like distance from different features of a finite rupture. Or does the data not is that still going to be just kind of in, in the noise? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we, you know, we, we did play around, I mean, the, the, these are kind of Gaussian processes once you get to the, um, you know, residuals, and so there are opportunities for kind of um, lots of numerical algorithms to think about characterization. Um, I think to some degree these, you know, and this is the same, uh, the same challenge that the ground motion modelers have, is that most of our data is in, you know, not necessarily the places where we want to make the predictions, and so, yeah, you know, same thing here. I think some of these like rupture complexities just aren't. So there's not as much data that is really going to drive us from a statistical sense. Um, but, but that's not to say that we shouldn't, you know, get the physics right in those cases. I'll make one other comment that, that might be interesting is that um, we're not purely free in terms of functional forms on these, and that these correlation um, predictions have to produce um, positive definite correlation matrices when you look at like the whole field. Um, so there's just an admissibility problem, like internal consistency requirements. And so the, the tradition a lot of times in these random field models is to stick with functional forms that are guaranteed to produce positive definite matrices. And so some of our functional forms is just driven by the fact that we know we'll get an admissible model at the end. Okay. Um, and we've used kind of typical models for kind of polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates and things to get that um, down. So we're, we're, we are somewhat constrained. That's not to say this is the only parameterization, though. Um, but I think if we got too, a little too fancy in terms of some metrics, we might end up with kind of internally inconsistent correlations in some cases. So we'd have to just keep an eye on that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Jack. Thank you for a great presentation. I just wanted to ask a question about the VS30. So yeah. you mentioned it um, in passing, but are you only using data that has measured VS30? Or what, what's, what's sort of the assumption that you have, and what are your thoughts on improvements in that area? Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so our data set's got a, a mix of, we're, and we're using primarily the NGA West 2 ground motion data set for those folks that are familiar with it. Um, and we've got a bit of a mix of measured and inferred VS30 values. Um, and we're just using the preferred VS30 that was developed by the NGA West 2 folks that, you know, painstakingly built that database. Um, and there's some folks in the front that are thinking more carefully than us about, uh, you know, the differences between uh, those. Um, I think there's a, there's, there's a, you know, a bit of a mixed bag there that, I would expect kind of higher correlations if we were using inferred VS30 values because there would be more unexplained site conditions, but the, the slope inferred VS30 or geology inferred VS30 would still indicate some commonality, um, whereas a, a measured VS30 might get a little more predictive and so a little less signal to be picked up in these correlations. So that's, that's pure speculation, though, um, and, and to be sorted out a little more carefully by us or others. Yeah. Thank you. We won't let you go yet. Just yeah, um, great I'll, talk. I'll Jack. hang out if you will. It was, it was fun. Um, I, I might have missed it, but um, do you consider topography in some way? I mean, uh, I think you know, like Taiwan is a very mountainous area, so there's a lot of scattering happening, yep. And, yep. and topography plays a huge role in that, which in areas is a completely different area. So, so is that in the model embedded in some way, or if not yet, is that something? you could easily include because that has a huge impact on the ground motion variability. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, so, so topography is not explicitly in there, um, but it may be implicitly to some degree. Um, and, I, and my understanding is the topographic effects on just ground motion amplitude at one location is still kind of a developing area. It's not commonly incorporated in, say, ground motion models used for hazard analysis, say. Um, to the extent that there are topographic effects, I'm, I'm thinking about like Banks Peninsula in New Zealand or, or something like that, where there, there was some kind of speculation about topographic effects uh, there. 
that, that may be um, present to some degree in this kind of slight effects that I just kind of lumped in with like everything not predicted by the ground motion model. And that if you're on a similar geologic unit or similar VS30 values, you may be either in a, in a plain, you know, soft soil condition or, or up in a kind of a rock, more hilly condition. And that you might indirectly get it topography, but it's not anything we've like explicitly hypothesized or tested. Um, again, I'm, I'm really speculating beyond what we've studied. So, yeah, good thought. I'll ask a slightly outlandish question. So um, there's a lot of work on DAS going on, and um, that's kind of the extreme spatial correlation mm -hmm. example. And so do you have any musings or thoughts on the potential for using DAS to, to fully improve sort of the, you know, the spatial correlation at very fine scale? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say other than I really enjoy listening to the folks that are looking at these DAS data sets and the, the kind of magical features that they pull out of them. Um, you know, the, of course, the, the ability to kind of sample almost continuously is, is certainly compelling. I think, you know, potentially to the, to the um, degree that um, folks could get at kind of side effects or near surface geology and see kind of, um, uh, you know, discrete changes in, in, in site conditions, could, could we also see like a discrete change in any sort of ground motion metrics that might might get at a little bit more causality again in, in kind of the relationship between our kind of proxies for, for site conditions and, and what's really going on in a more complex process. Um, that, that's probably where I'd be interested first to, to ask around, but I think there's, you know, the kind of, the, the type of, of data that's getting rec re, you know, um, recovered from these DAS uh, deployments versus a, kind of a three degree of freedom strong motion instrument. There's, there's some differences there that I, I haven't really kind of sorted through what, how, to, how to link the two together. So. I'm, I'm rambling at this point, so I better shut up. Well, so if you're interested in Arcata, there's a DAS running on 15 kilometers, and there are 30 or 40 nodes sitting next to it at 50 meter or maybe 100 meter separation. Yeah, yeah, that's the kind. And of three broadbands and accelerometers near them. But the question I was going to ask, I know in Japan and 2008 and 2011 or 2007 and 2008 or 10 or something, there were two earthquakes essentially the same size in the same location with the same network mm -hmm. next to them. And Japan has lots of accelerometers. So, so there are data sets that you could use to do yep. some of the repeat experiments or not. Yeah, I think that's, there's a lot of promise in, in kind of looking at those data sets more closely. The DAS deployment sounds quite interesting as well, so maybe I'll have to ask a little more about that one. Thank you. And they were lucky or unlucky enough to have lots of earthquakes, including a magnitude 5.4, not too far away. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.